I had just gone to confession at St. Mary's Church in York, Pennsylvania, when upon walking out into the vestibule, I saw a painting of a young, strong-faced bishop with a cross hung around his neck. I learned his name from the plaque on the frame, St. John Neumann, pray for us. The painting reminded me of many others I'd seen in churches all throughout the diocese and even across New York. My mind was plagued with questions about him. What did he do? Why are there so many portraits of him in northern churches? Little did I know that he built 89 churches in the course of seven years and opened almost 100 schools. The ground that I walked on was sanctified by his heroic sacrifice more than 100 years ago. Upon further research, I found that his intransigent personality is best understood when you look at his early days as a missionary priest on the rough frontiers of 19th century America. In this video, you'll hear of his apostolate at Niagara Falls and Buffalo, where he cured a blind girl, shut down in a moral dance at a dangerous bar, publicly debated Protestants in their own meeting house, and was almost hanged by ruffians. Since this is a reading podcast, I'll cite all of the amazing books that I used for research in the description below. The Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. Even in his youth, St. John Neumann's vocation was so apparent that the parish catechist said, I admired John Neumann even as a boy. When I looked at him, I thought of St. John the Baptist. He joined the seminary at Budweiss, Bohemia, which is now known as the Czech Republic. He found two other seminarians who wanted to be missionaries as well. They begged their superiors to let them go and spread the faith of Christ. After many months, the three obtained permission to go to America. It wasn't long before Deacon Neumann set sail for America in 1836. However, he was alone because the two other missionaries had backed out at the last minute. He was ordained in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York on June 25, 1836. Soon after his ordination, he was sent far out into the frontier country. His area of apostolic work covered hundreds of square miles, Niagara Falls, Buffalo, New York, and Erie, Pennsylvania. His missionary life there was extremely difficult. It entailed walking on foot through mud, snow, and rain to give the sacraments to some sick person or to say mass in some faraway town. Sometimes he would walk 40 miles in a day, which left his feet aching and swollen. Oh my gosh, it's too cold here. Come on, Griffin, let's go. While passing through different parishes, he would try to improve the looks of each church he visited because they were in terrible condition. He even wept at the sight of one church because it was so dilapidated it looked like an old barn. Sometimes the building would have a roof but no walls like a pavilion and would leave the parishioners exposed to the cold rain and snow. They also had to cope with the many insults and jeers from anti-Catholics which were prevalent at the time. St. John Neumann was never lenient with his parishioners if he thought their souls were in danger. There was once a rowdy and immoral bar nearby his church, which made so much noise that the congregation could barely hear him celebrate Mass. He even noticed some of his flock enter that house of sin. Remember that he wasn't against having a drink every now and then. It was mostly the worldly atmosphere that permeated the establishment. Then the barkeeper announced a dance, on Sunday no less. Many of the Catholics saw no harm in it, and actually wanted to go. This was too much for Father Neumann, and he said that if they went through with the dance, he would leave the parish forever. But the townspeople didn't believe him. He was too kind-hearted to leave. So it came as a complete surprise when, on the day of the dance, they saw him making preparations to get out of town. They all crowded around him and begged him to stay. Then stop the dance, he shot back, but they whined in protest at this. Finally, even the barkeeper came out, and a heated argument ensued, but at the end, he canceled the dance because of the priest's insistence. After that, the barkeep decided he had better pack up and leave town, because this priest was making his business impossible. The townspeople knew to never test Father John's patience again. There was once a blacksmith who asked our saint to take Holy Communion to a sick family member who was dying. Father John immediately snapped into action and started out on his mission, briskly walking on foot, for she lived a long way off. Some time later, the blacksmith finished his work and hurriedly rode home, fearing the worst for his loved one. 
It was just starting to get dark when he suddenly saw men with torches in the road ahead who scuttled off and disappeared in the darkness. He pulled up to see what they could have been up to and found Father Neumann lying in the road, trussed hand and foot with a loose rope around his neck. The priest had been mistaken by some farmers for a swindler who had wronged them, and they thought that the cassock was just a cheap disguise. They knocked the poor priest flat on his back and tied him up. It seemed they were getting ready to hang him when they opened his knapsack, saw his vestments and mass materials, and realized his cassock was no disguise. The discovery didn't seem to make much of a difference because the ruffians decided to kill him anyway. They hated priests. It was at this point, thank God, that the blacksmith came riding along and scared the scoundrels away. After that incident, they gave the priest a horse so that he wouldn't be such easy prey, but the stupid beast was so flighty that the saint was constantly getting bucked off, and he invariably ended up leading the horse on foot anyway. He never had much luck with horses. Once, when he was riding in a buggy along a terribly windy road, there was a sharp turn which launched him violently out of his seat into the woods. He landed directly on his back, and the pain put him out of commission for many days, which was unusual for him because he was rarely sick. His good health was on account of his great knowledge of herbal remedies, and people all around used to come to him for medical advice. Some of his most effective medicines, however, were the sacraments that sometimes cure the body as well as the soul. One night, on the way back from a sick call, St. John Neumann was traveling through the woods when a torrent of rain came flooding down. It was so bad that he lost his way. Groping in the darkness and soaked to the skin, he finally stumbled upon an old hovel. He knocked at the door repeatedly, but every time a timid voice simply responded, We let no one in at night. After explaining that he was a priest and knocking persistently for some time, he was finally admitted by a little blind girl. Her father was lying on the mossy ground, groaning in the delirium of a raging fever. When he saw this, Father John immediately made the man swallow some of the rich wine that he used for mass. This revived the poor man, and he asked to make his confession because he was an Irish Catholic. It wasn't long before his sins were absolved, and he had received Holy Communion. When Father John rose to leave him the next morning, the Irishman was fully recovered from his ailment that had nearly taken his life. Not only did St. John Neumann cure the father of his fever, but he also cured the daughter of her blindness. He gave her a small miraculous medal to wear around her neck, which she kissed devoutly. As the little priest stumped off through the woods, he smiled as he heard behind him, Papa, Papa! I can see the sky. There were a great number of Baptists who converted through hearing an inspiring debate in which Father John defended the one true faith. It all began on a cold, snowy Sunday in February when he was walking up a forest path to his church. Some Baptists passing by pulled up their sleigh and asked, Where are you going, little priest? He knew that they had a strong prejudice against Catholics, but he accepted their offer to take him into town. After some conversation, it was obvious they were trying to evangelize him. They said that they pitied Catholic priests because of their hard celibate life. If he were a preacher, the congregation would give him a sleigh so that he wouldn't have to walk everywhere, and he could have a wife to look after him when he got home. Besides, they said to finish off their argument, we have the true religion. We have the Holy Ghost. He had to suppress a smile at their shallow attempts to win him over. With an effort to look interested, he asked how he could be evangelized. They joyously told him that he could come to their meeting house next Sunday, and he accepted. But in the back of his mind, he was preparing for a stirring debate to convert these heretics. They had no idea what they were in for. Somehow, news of the upcoming debate spread far and wide throughout the frontier, which caused Protestants and Catholics alike to flock to the meeting house on the appointed day. Father John was in high spirits, like a lion ready to be loosed. Father Pox, a priest in a nearby village, came to town and asked Father Neumann if he needed help. He responded, With the help of our blessed lady who crushes all heresy, I'll manage this battle single-handed, Father Pox. He began the debate by asking if the Holy Ghost was the author of their Bible. Of course, they retorted, he is its author in every language and edition. St. John Neumann responded that in that case, every Bible in the room must say the same thing. 
since God cannot contradict himself. They all nodded in approval. Then he asked the preacher to read the same verse in three different Bibles. Of course, they were entirely different from one another. The people in the room buzzed with curiosity at this phenomenon. The preacher defiantly said that it didn't matter because they all had the Holy Ghost within them. They didn't need the Bible because the Holy Ghost would tell them what they needed to know. He said that he had once led a bad life as a cattle hustler. He had lied, cheated, and stole, but now the Holy Ghost had spoken to him and converted him. At this, Father Neumann asked everyone if the preacher had given back what he stole. No, they all answered, he never did. So you could hardly call his conversion genuine, asked the saint. No, he's the same old rogue he ever was, they all agreed. No one listened to the preacher anymore after that, and he had to pack up and roll out of town. This debate caused many Baptists to convert to Catholicism because they were impressed at the little priest's solid reasoning. He became a redemptorist in 1842 and was later raised to Bishop of Philadelphia in 1852, but the higher office caused no decline in his apostolic efforts. He took pains to visit all of the parishes he had frequented in the past and saw to it that the parishes grew and multiplied. He not only built churches, but founded schools and is known as the father of education in his bishopric. He cared for all immigrants, Irish and Germans alike, with filial charity. He even studied Gaelic so that he could understand the Irish immigrants. This actually wasn't much of a challenge because by the time he left the seminary, he had already mastered eight languages. There was once an old Irish woman who went to confession to him. It was the first time in many years because there weren't any priests who could speak Gaelic in that part of America. Afterwards, she said, Thanks be to God, we now have an Irish bishop. He fiercely fought anti-Catholic sects in his diocese. The worst of them were the know-nothings. If they were asked any questions about their society, they would respond that they knew nothing. All the stress began to wear on St. John Neumann. He had called himself a husky bohemian mountain lad in the past, but now he realized that his health was failing him. On January 5, 1860, he sought to have a statue of Our Lady repaired and was walking down a street in Philadelphia when he suddenly collapsed from a stroke. He was only 48 years old when he died. His life was a glorious struggle for the expansion of Our Lord's Church in order to save souls, and he stands ready to intercede for us in heaven. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to see a playlist of all the stories that good Catholics should know, just click on the link above me here. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.